Welcome everybody to a new episode of Beyond the Patterns and today I have the great pleasure to introduce David B. Lindell and Julian Martel from Stanford Engineering in our short video here. So both of them are from Stanford Engineering. Julian Martel is a postdoctoral research fellow at Stanford University in Computational Imaging Lab, led by Gordon Wettstein. His research interests are in unconventional visual sensing and processing. More specifically, his current topics of research include the co-design of hardware and algorithms for visual sensing, the design of methods for vision sensors with in pixel computing capabilities and the use of novel representations for visual data such as neural implicit representations. David B. Lindo is also a postdoctoral scholar in the Department of Electrical Engineering in Stanford University. His research interests are in the areas of computational imaging, machine learning and remote sensing. Most recently, he has worked on developing neural representations for applications in vision and rendering. He has also developed advanced 3D imaging systems to capture objects hidden around corners or through scattering media. So it's a great pleasure to have both of them here. And today their presentation will be entitled Implicit Neural Representation Networks for Fitting Signals, Derivatives and Integrals. So I'm very much looking forward to your presentation and the stage is yours. Thanks very much for that introduction. And uh, again, thank you for the invitation. We're delighted to be here. Uh, Julian and I will be sharing this presentation. And uh, as I understand, there'll be a chance to uh, engage in some Q&A afterwards. So we're looking forward to that as well. Um, so one thing we sometimes take for granted is the way that we work with signals. And this talk is about an emerging way to represent signals as the output of simple neural networks. And we'll go over some of our recent work on neural representations and coordinate-based networks uh, to represent signals, their derivatives, as well as integrals. And so how we represent signals can actually have a, a pretty large impact on how we solve problems and the types of algorithms that we use. And very commonly, discrete representations for signals are used. For example, we represent images with a grid of pixels, uh, we represent shapes with maybe a, a, a point cloud, and we will use, for example, discrete samples for the amplitudes of a sound wave to represent audio signals. And recently, neural implicit representations or coordinate-based networks have emerged as a new way to represent 3D shapes encoded as the zero level set of a sign distance function. So here a signal is parameterized continuously as a ReLU, neural network that maps some XYZ coordinate input to the signed distance or could be the occupancy at that XYZ location. And this is an emerging representation that has a lot of benefits. Uh, first, it's agnostic to the specific grid resolution and the memory required to represent the signal generally scales with the complexity of the signal independent of the spatial resolution or some globally highest frequency in the signal. And while ReLU networks are capable of representing simple objects such as the Stanford bunny, uh, they usually fail to encode complex or larger scale scenes with fine details, such as this room scale environment, like we see here in this bottom image, has a lot of artifacts. And more generally, we could ask whether these architectures are able to represent other complex signals like images uh, or um, audio signals. And interestingly, we have shown that common network architectures using ReLU or hyperbolic tangent nonlinearities fail at capturing high frequency detail present in most natural signals. Another motivation for modeling signals with continuous representations is to solve physics-based problems. So here, these types of coordinate-based networks, uh, also called implicit neural representations, 
could enable first solving these problems faster, as well as finding better solutions by learning priors over the space of signals that we want to represent. And for physics applications, it's really important that these architectures can model not only the signal, but also derivatives of a signal um, to enable solving partial differential equations. So we're going to talk about that in this talk. Um, but again, common network architectures will fail at fitting functions uh, via their derivatives or fitting functions and their derivatives. So uh, in the... In, in, in this talk, we're, we're going to introduce sinusoidal representation networks, uh, which we call SIREN. And this is a simple multi-layer perceptron network architecture that uses the periodic sign as its nonlinearity. And we have a few reasons why we think this uh, is actually useful or intuitions as to why using the sign nonlinearity helps. And the first is that conventional nonlinearities like ReLU are monotonically increasing and they're also localized. Um, so the nonlinear part of the activation is at a single point in the input domain. And so they can't replicate their, this activation function across, across the input domain. Um, if we compare to the sign activation, the sign is periodic and nonlinear across the whole domain. And so we believe that this is useful for coordinate-based networks as it may allow them to represent different parts of the input domain uh, equally well without having to explicitly place a nonlinearity there. A second advantage is that uh, all derivatives of a sign exist. Uh, derivatives of sign are just other signs or shifted signs. And as we'll see, this turns out to be advantageous in applications where first, second, or higher order derivatives need to be represented by the network. In contrast, uh, functions parameterized, parameterized by ReLU networks can't represent signals where the second order derivative is non-zero, uh, for example, in uh, signals defined by the wave equation. And so we'll show that SIREN is not only able to rapidly converge to an accurate fit for complicated functions with high frequency details, but we can also use SIREN to fit functions whose first and second order derivatives uh, are non-zero and need to be fit and we can use this then to solve partial differential equations. Now, coordinate networks are an emerging field and so far they've been mostly used in the context of 3D reconstruction and novel view synthesis. Um, neural networks have been used in a similar capacity to solve partial differential equations, uh, but they've mainly been relying in these frameworks on local activation functions like the hyperbolic tan tangent. The sign activation function has been explored in the context of neural network architectures for different tasks, but has so far uh, up till our work failed to robustly outperform conventional alternative activation functions in neural networks. Um, now concurrent with our work uh, were recently proposed positional encodings in NERF and, and the follow on work on Fourier features in NERF's 2020. And these also use a, a sign embedding that's fixed at the first layer of the neural network, followed by a conventional, uh, usually ReLU MLP. And this also allows learning of high frequency details, uh, but turns out not to work as well at, mo at modeling derivatives. And with SIREN, we show that the properties of the sign activation specifically make it a good fit for uh, neural representations, modeling derivatives, as well as solving partial differential equations. So here we are going into the um, result part of this uh, first part of the talk. We are going to demonstrate SIREN's performance for a range of applications. Uh, from representing natural signals, uh, where we fit the values directly, such as for images, audio, or videos, um, and solving problems that are rooted in physics, uh, where we impose constraints on the first order derivatives and where these implicit representations can really shine, such as the, in, in the iconal equation, the second order derivatives uh, that we can fit in the Poisson Helmholtz or wave equation. So let's start with uh, images. So first, we're going to fit a siren supervised by an image F that we define on pixel coordinates. So these are the inputs to the implicit representation. And in this problem, we're thinking the uh, uh, implicit representation phi that is parameterized by the siren that can minimize the discrepancy between the RGB or the grayscale value of the image uh, and the output of the neural network for each pixel. 
And so the first thing we do is that we make a comparison against a different baseline architecture that use different nonlinearities, such as the rectified linear unit, the hyperbolic tangent, uh, the positional encoding that uh, was presented in uh, Mildenhall et al. in 2019, as well as uh, more conventional regression uh, neural network, um, such as radial basis functions that were leveraged in the 80s for function interpolation. And here, not only we show that Siren achieves a 10 dB higher PSNR than all the baseline approaches, and that it converges significantly faster, um, but it's also the only architecture that is able to faithfully reproduce the first and second spatial derivatives of the image. And here, I'd like to draw the attention one minute on what we mean by reproducing the first and second spatial derivatives of the image. We are not taking the discrete derivative. Uh, we are taking the derivative of the output of the neural network with respect to its inputs. And so in this setting, clearly, uh, we can see that uh, uh, Sirens is the only neural network really able to uh, faithfully capture the uh, gradients, or here when we calculate the Laplacian to give an accurate second order uh, derivative. And so you can carry out a similar experiment to fit audio waveforms, where now you map time points t to an amplitude, which is the amplitude of the sound wave, f of t, and you directly supervise your uh, neural network representation phi by this uh, ground truth audio amplitude. And here again, in this scenario uh, that we first tested uh, on a voice signal, Siren is the only architecture that is able to fit the waveform at all. Zero, one, two, three, four, Five, six, seven, eight, nine. And here, let's listen to the relu. And with positional encoding. Five. Which is interesting because it fits correctly only at the zero of the input domain. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And this uh, continues also for a piece of music. <laughs> So next, we demonstrate that uh, Siren may also directly parameterize video signals. And so here, kind of as a natural extension of these image and audio examples, we can uh, train a Siren by mapping a uh, time and a uh, pixel coordinate, so in the X, uh, T spatial temporal domain, to color at that particular position, uh, supervised by the direct uh, ground truth uh, video frames. And so here's still same scenario, seeking the function phi, minimizing the discrepancy between phi and the uh, uh, ground truth frame fxt. And so here, Siren can be seen to fit details significantly more accurately than conventional multi-layer perceptrons with uh, rectified linear units. And, and note that the video is quite complex with different scenes with little self-similarity. But this is also true uh, for videos uh, that uh, exhibit a lot of self-similarity across time. And here, um, Siren really shows how it can fit the spatial temporal signal much more accurately. Okay, so what we've talked about so far is fitting sirens uh, or networks directly to a signal that is directly supervising on uh, the samples of the signal themselves. But we can also use sirens to fit derivative information, as I mentioned before. So in this experiment, we supervise the gradient of the network representing, in this case, phi, with the gradient of a target function. 
And so here we supervise not on the signal itself, but on its gradient, and we're supervising the gradient of the network again. And uh, uh, just to reiterate, so in this case, we're, we're only looking at the gradient information, and we're never supervising on the signal itself. And again, we calculate the gradient of the neural network using auto differentiation, and then that is what is the output that goes into our loss function when we uh, update the network weights. And so by evaluating the, the network after training its derivative at different pixel positions or at different coordinates, it essentially performs an image reconstruction, despite the fact that it's never seen the image, only the gradients. Um, and, and this is basically equivalent to solving a Poisson equation. And so when we compare, again, to other nonlinearities, we see that uh, Siren is the only one that can accurately fit the first and second order derivative information and uh, can also solve this, um, solve this Poisson equation. And the convergence of Siren is also much, much faster um, in, in terms of fitting this derivative information using the derivative of the network. And we can leverage this property of being able to fit derivative information across a diverse set of applications. For example, solving partial differential equations or boundary value problems. And so, uh, in this application, we de demonstrate using Siren to solve the iconal equation, which describes a class of functions whose uh, gradient magnitude is equal to one. And so uh, in particular, we can use this to do surface reconstruction for shapes where the surface of the shape is encoded in the zero level set of a sine distance function. And so here we're looking for a function uh, that we're a phi that we fit the network to that should have its gradient magnitude equal to one everywhere. So it's a sine distance function and the function should be zero on the set of points that we take as input as a point cloud. Uh, and we also assume that uh, we have as our uh, input training data, an oriented point cloud. So we know the normals at each point and we can supervise the gradient of the network at these point cloud points to align with, with the point cloud normals. And so in this way, we can take as input a point cloud and our network can learn a sine distance function representation by learning a solution to this iconal equation. And so we can show some results after we've trained this network on a point cloud with oriented normals. And what we're showing here is actually the zero level set that's extracted out of the network after training. And we're comparing the uh, output of a ReLU network that's been trained for this task with Siren. And we see that we get a much, much higher detailed uh, representation out of Siren compared to ReLU. Uh, and this is the Thai statue model from the Stanford 3D model repository. We can even represent uh, whole room size scenes with a single connected Siren. This has five layers and 1,024 hidden units. And Again, here we can compare to a ReLU network where there are far more artifacts and uh, ReLU networks fail to capture the same amount of detail as Siren. And in fact, we can capture small details with Siren like the feet of the sofa, the ripples and the curtains, uh, as well as you know, the, the, the plate on the table and, and other details in this room size scene. Another example we can show is uh, solving partial differential equations like the Helmholtz equation that have dependency on the second order derivative. And so in this case, the input to the network is again, some spatial coordinate and the output will be here, a uh, complex valued, uh, a complex value representing the solution to the Helmholtz equation. And to supervise the network, um, Basically what we have here is, is, is we're trying to get the network to represent the solution to the Helmholtz equation. And so to do that, we're going to minimize the residual of the partial differential equation at all of these input spatial coordinates. And this, this residual is um, simply a measure of how well the siren satisfies the partial differential equation. And uh, this is the term here, you see the loss function you see on the right, which uh, has as input uh, second order derivative of the neural network and uh, an input source term, which we, we set to be 
some source at the center of the domain. And so you'll see these ripple-like patterns expanding outwards. Another thing that we have to take into account for solving the Helmholtz equation are the boundary values. So in order to ensure that there's a unique solution here, we add these perfectly matched boundary layers, which attenuate the outgoing waves uh, to make sure that there's no uh, incident energy into the solution coming from outside the domain. And this just ensures that the problem is well posed. And uh, so now if we compare to, again, other types of neural networks with ReLU or hyperbolic tangent nonlinearities, we see that, again, Siren is the only architecture that can actually be used to solve this type of differential equation by minimizing the residual of the PDE. And uh, another application that kind of builds off this Helmholtz equation is solving the wave equation. And again, this is a situation where we're training on uh, the input to the network are these spatial coordinates, but now we add a time dimension, and the output is uh, the solution to the wave equation across space and time. And again, here we'll minimize the residual of the PDE. So the loss function uh, takes as input the second order derivative of the neural network output with respect to time. Uh, this can, again, just be calculated using automatic differentiation, and it also takes into uh, takes as input second order spatial derivatives, again calculated using autodiff. And if we minimize the residual of the PDE, we can see that actually Siren converges well to a solution of the of the wave equation. Whereas again, other nonlinearities, networks using other nonlinearities won't converge because they can't accurately model this gradient information. And finally, we we also demonstrated that we can uh, parameterize the space of functions using a siren in order to learn a prior. So in this case, we leveraged a convolutional encoder that regresses a latent code, which we map to the parameters of a siren using a hyper network. This is basically just demonstrating that we can use a siren to represent not just a sing sing single signal, but a space of signals, uh, in this case, images. And so as we demonstrate here for this task of image inpainting, we can basically take as input some sparse observations of an image and then optimize a latent code uh, that maps to a siren that parameterizes uh, a whole image and can figure out, you know, based on whatever these sparse observations are, what's a plausible uh, input image from this image prior. And so this is just demonstrating that we can use sirens to generalize over a space of functions. And um, there, if you're interested in this as well, there are more details in the paper. So let's summarize this uh, very first part of our talk. So here we've shown that Siren can be thought as this new type of data representation that can be used for natural signals to represent these natural signals, such as sounds, images, videos, or shapes. But because it's also differentiable, it can be used as a data structure that you plug in this kind of physics informed neural network when you minimize the residual of um, a PDE to be used in this uh, uh, PDE equation uh, solvers. So, um, Siren has um, several advantages over alternative representations. So, compared to discrete representation, its memory requirements scale with the signal complexity rather than with the resolution. So if you had like a, a bigger image, you don't necessarily need a bigger network provided that the image is not more complex in some sense. And I think it's gonna be clear in uh, five or six minutes what we mean in, in this uh, statement when we look in the second part of our talk with uh, ACORN. And also uh, Siren's gradients and the higher order derivatives as, we, as we've seen can be computed easily at each point of the input domain via this uh, auto differentiation technique. Uh, which will actually leverage uh, in uh, the third part of our talk with uh, uh, auto int. And compared to implicit representations that use this uh, conventional nonlinearities, such as ReLU, uh, Siren fits the signals with high frequency details much better, more rapidly, and um, allows us to um, fit these uh, PDEs. This representation also can be very compact and can be used for compressions. And this is something that uh, is being actively investigated uh, in the literature. So for instance, the 3D model that we presented of the tie statue is encoded in less than 800 kilobytes of 
weights. These are the weights of the neural representation that you need to keep uh, to uh, extract uh, later the, the neural network and the zero level sets. So if Sarah and another type of coordinate networks are to replace conventional grid-based representation in some of some applications or all of our applications, one of the natural things to ask is how can we get those networks to represent large scale signals? And previously we, we've shown that Siren easily fits short videos, five tall by five tall images and small shapes. Um, but one of the difficulty we meet in using coordinate based networks for large scale representation is that um, every point in the volume that you query is evaluated by one forward pass of the neural network. So clearly, if you had to evaluate even a moderately sized volume of a thousand voxels of side length, the volume would contain one billion voxels and you would need one billion forward passes for a potentially large neural network to query this volume. And this is prohib prohibitively large at inference. Um, although it's not even clear that the network you would build uh, would have enough capacity to represent such a volume. And if so, it would uh, probably take days to train. And so, the literature has actually um, looked uh, at this, and we are about to present another architecture that addresses these challenges. But first, let's see in more details um, issues with various existing architectures that one could envision uh, using um, to use to represent these large scale signals. So the, the first thing, and maybe more conventionally used uh, architecture, is the voxel grid, and and th those are the architectures we call explicit architectures, and they come with neural networks. Uh, in different favor, but uh, their commonalities, they take voxel grids of features defined on the inputs and they output the signal of interest. So this is, for instance, the type of um, a representation you find in deep voxels or in uh, neural volumes, which are uh, 2018 and 2019 papers. So those are typically computationally efficient um, since you can address the representation with a, or query the representation, I should say, with a single lookup but they are memory inefficient because for large scale, I mean, even for small scale, you need to explicitly store the whole uh, grid. So another type of uh, architecture that we just presented are this vanilla implicit representation or coordinate based network. And as we saw, they do not operate directly on the grid of features, but they take input coordinates to regress the signal. And so again, this is what you do in Siren, this is what you do in Fourier features, uh, which are uh, or ReLU with positional encodings. Um, and those representations, they typically embed some compression capabilities by representing the signal as if they were decomposed on some basis function. They are memory efficient, but querying them, as we say, require the forward pass in the neural network uh, for every single query you have. And another thing that appeared quite recently is what people have called local implicit representation. And they take the stance of fitting a signal with a coordinate-based network implicit function, but in a local fashion, for instance, using different networks for different parts of space or to decode features that encode different regions of space. Mm -hmm. So they are usually more efficient than the explicit representations and they can be more efficient, computationally efficient than the implicit representation uh, as they might uh, only um, require to evaluate the signal locally. However, they represent the signal at a single scale. And depending on the given architecture that you're looking at, they might or might not allow pruning. So they might or might not represent uh, empty part of space. And this we think is actually very important also um, to skip empty space, for instance, to uh, preserve your um, uh, capacity to actually fit details of the signals uh, in um, other, parts of, uh, other parts of space. Mm -hmm. And so here, the type of representation we are going to uh, present is both computationally and memory efficient, and is going to represent part of the signal at scales that depend on the amount of detail it contains. And the architecture is gonna embed um, an algorithm also for pruning in order to only use the resources of the neural network in regions of the signals that actually need it. And it's going to consist of a global coordinate encoder that encodes block coordinates to a small feature grid that can be decoded with a continuous local um, uh, representation into the signal of interest. And so we named this architecture ACORN for adaptive coordinate networks. Mm -hmm. 
So as we'll see, not only the ACON architecture can fit signals better than simpler architectures like SARIN or uh, local implicit representation, but it's also much, much faster as demonstrated in those uh, first results where we can fit here a 16 megapixel image, so 4K side length, uh, to almost uh, 33 dB of PSNR in less uh, than a minute, where it would actually take about 80 minutes with a conventional, so an hour 20 with a conventional siren to um, represent the image at the same level of uh, accuracy. And as you see also on the bottom right corner, uh, we also learn uh, decomposition of the signal in an um, adapted fashion. So in fact, ACORN allows us to train representation in general a couple order of magnitude faster than SARIN because the whole trick is going to be that we are not going to do most of the um, bulk of the computation for every single point, uh, but we're ever gonna do it in a block fashion. Um, and so fitting now a 64 megapixel image of Pluto, so now 8K by 8K side length to over uh, 30 dB can be done within a minute uh, compared to the hours required to train uh, SARIN. So David is gonna tell us how does that uh, work. Okay, so one of the key ideas with SIRIN is that we're optimizing not only the signal, but the partitioning of space, how we represent the signal. And so here we're gonna illustrate that uh, in 3D with an overlap uh, where we divide the space into overlapping blocks of different sizes. And so this optimization that we perform to, opt to, to, to divide up the space uh, is not carried out a priori, but we actually do this online while training by feeding back the training error in each cell or each block into an integer linear program that selects whether to merge or split these blocks. Um, and so here we're going to fix the total number of blocks that we're optimizing. And this we believe is related to the network capacity. And this integer linear program is again, basically deciding how we're going to partition the blocks. And we also need a, a way to parameterize uh, the coordinates of these blocks because again, Again, still our network is taking some coordinate as input and is going to map those two features within a block that will be decoded to represent the signal within a block. And so we choose to uniquely identify each block with a global coordinate. And inside each block, uh, we have local coordinates. And we also need to, uh, we also parameterize the scale of each block. So there are basically three coordinates that go into the network. The global coordinate, which is unique to a block, local coordinates, which are uh, a relative coordinate system inside the block, and then the particular scale at which uh, the block exists. And uh, so we'll feed these coordinates to a coordinate encoder, which is a simple fully connected neural network. And then this coordinate encoder will output a long vector that we can interpret as a grid of features with multiple channels. And this feature grid will basically contains the information that gives us the signal within each block. And so we can uh, obtain that signal by interpolating this feature grid at the relative coordinate within the block that allows us to extract a vector of um, features, one for every channel where we interpolate. And this interpolation is, is just done using a trilinear interpolation in 3D. And then we can decode this interpolated feature vector using a very small decoder network into uh, the signal that we're representing. For example, for 3D shapes, the output of the network could just be the occupancy at that point, whether or not that point falls within a, a, a 3D object or not. And so uh, this architecture we find is very well suited to represent large scale signals. And the reason for this is twofold. The first is that we can represent different parts of the signal at different scales. And so if we're representing images, for example, we don't need to expend a lot of network capacity to represent parts of the image that are flat textured uh, or aren't very complicated. The second is that 
when we're, we're training the network or running inference, we only need to run a single forward pass through the bulk of the network to represent a whole block. And so, you know, if there's a region of the, of the signal we're trying to represent that's not very detailed, but encompasses a large area of the domain, we simply uh, encode that as a single block. We run a single forward pass through uh, the bulk of the network that contains most of the parameters. And then we've, we've encoded that entire block with, these, uh, with the output feature grids. And then any point within that block can be decoded using this very light decoder network which is efficient to evaluate. And this, this allows us to uh, train and evaluate this network very quickly, very efficiently, even on large scale scenes. And so I think this is a cool result where we scale up this type of coordinate based network uh, to a very large scale. In fact, this is a gigapixel image that we fit the network with. And prior to this point, the largest scale image that we'd shown uh, represented by a coordinate-based network was about a megapixel. So this is about a thousand times larger than uh, what anyone had done before in terms of fitting a signal. Okay, yeah, and so we can actually zoom in here to show you just how much detail is in this gigapixel image. And I don't know how well the video comes through, but basically the, the rendering rendered output of the network is visually indistinguishable from the output of the ground truth. Uh, you should be able to see if the video is coming through uh, it kind of sliding back and forth between the network output and the ground truth. And so again, this, this basically represents fitting the network to uh, a dense signal like this image at, that has a, a billion data points, a gigapixel image. We can also use the network to fit 3D signals. So here are some results on fitting uh, complex 3D shapes. And both qualitatively and quantitatively, we see that adaptive coordinate networks or ACORN uh, can outperform previous work. So they capture more details than SIREN. And if we look at quantitative metrics like uh, chamfer distance or F1 score, we, we also see that uh, it outperforms those met methods quantitatively. Uh, so, for example, for this dragon statue, we see a lot more details, like the details on the scales and on the legs that we can represent with this, uh, with, with, with ACORN. That gets smoothed out in other representations. And th this was a fun model to fit just because it had so much detail. So in this engine, you've got all these wires and tubes and gears and things. And we can capture these again, much better with ACORN, where the spring uh, kind of converges into a single block with other networks, but we're actually able to capture some of the details. And here's, again, this Thai statue model that we showed earlier in the presentation with Siren. And uh, there's even more detail that comes out when we use ACORN to represent this 3D shape. And like I mentioned, we're also learning this adaptive block decomposition. So we showed it in 2D, but you can also see it in 3D uh, as it trains. So on the left, we're showing how this block decomposition evolves during training. And there are two things going on. The blocks are being refined and split and merged, but empty space is also being pruned out during training. So um, after those uh, results, we, we really believe that those uh, coordinate-based networks uh, could constitute an alternative to conventional grid-like representations. And one of the key questions we have now is how can you operate on those new type of representation as you today operate on grid-like representation? Uh, so say you want to add uh, two signals defined on a grid today. Well, you would simply uh, take uh, the two points that are in the same bit, bin and uh, add them up. So we think overall that this new direction of taking coordinate-based networks for signal representation may actually lead to a new class of algorithms to operate on continuous representation. Uh, and those algorithms have this nice property to be agnostic to grid resolution. And so the interesting thing that we are going to demonstrate in this last part of the talk is that while some operations 
that you think about are trivial to perform on grid. Um, and that's the case of all these element-wise operations. So addition, element-wise multiplication, subtraction, division are actually very easy to do on grids because you simply take the points in the same bin and add them up. Uh, they are very difficult to perform on continuous based network because here you are uh, encoding uh, the signals really by uh, these weights and there's no linear mapping between a particular signal position and the, and the output. You, you cannot simply take two set of weights of two networks, add them up and hope that the addition of the two weights represents the addition of the output signal. But however, certain operations which are not easy on these grid-like representations are actually pretty easy on coordinate based network. And this is the case of integrals. And this is what we are going to talk about uh, in this third uh, part. So integral is an interesting uh, operation because it's a really a fundamental concept of uh, science and engineering. And it's ubiquitous in computer vision applications. Uh, and among these applications, neural volume rendering uh, has recently been uh, revived. Um, uh, volume rendering has recently been revived by neural volume rendering, uh, which proposed a new paradigm for view synthesis uh, that could achieve photorealistic uh, quality. And so in neural volume rendering, the volume rendering equation is used uh, for novel view synthesis, where you train a network to learn the absorption and emission parameters uh, um, of a volume through a large corpus of training views that are taken from different camera positions. And then you can render any view that, you've, that is unseen um, from uh, the learned volume after training. And for instance, given the set of views on the left, be able to do like this uh, full 360 uh, video uh, on the right. And this technique of volume rendering involves evaluating uh, integrals uh, along rays through a learned volume in order to render a scene. And evaluating these rays is computationally inefficient. It requires millions of queries to a neural network to sample each ray so that you can approximate uh, the integral along this ray and uh, use it to render an image. So here, we're going to propose a new method that is going to learn a closed form solution to integrals using neural networks. And we will show how it can be leveraged for computationally efficient uh, neural volume rendering. And here we're still in this paradigm of using uh, coordinate-based networks where the input is a low dimensional um, um, input domain. And uh, you typically want to integrate this function phi, uh, which is represented by neural, neural network, uh, the, the outputs of, uh, of a particular function you wish to uh, fit. So for instance, uh, as we saw previously, pixel coordinates will be your input domain and you're regressing the uh, grayscale or RGB values at, this, uh, at these uh, locations. And so our method is going to learn to evaluate integrals over functions defined by such coordinate-based networks. So in general, if you think about uh, integration and differentiation, finding closed form solutions to derivative calculation is a far easier task than solving integrals in a closed form. So for differentiation, you can use the chain rule, uh, which is a simple yet powerful tool that enables calculating derivatives uh, on very large computational graph. And it's really at the core of uh, training neural networks uh, through backpropagation uh, nowadays. But if you look at integration, finding closed form solutions for integrals is extremely challenging or even impossible. Uh, it requires expert application of heuristics, uh, extremely complex algorithms, which actually took decades to implement and are still being refined. So, so that's the case for this rich algorithm. And in general, I, I even want to say like two years of uh, calculus class uh, uh, after your high school. So that, that's what it takes to integrate. So instead of uh, doing closed form uh, integration, integrals are often approximated uh, numerically through techniques like Riemann sums or uh, quadratures where you uh, sample a few points on your integral and weigh them appropriately by some uh, polynomial and are able to compute the uh, area under the integral, the area under the curve, or uh, Monte Carlo sampling, uh, like it's actually usually done in, um, in volume rendering. So still the sampling-based methods come with a fundamental trade-off. 
between accuracy and runtime, then typically based on the number of sample you use to approximate the integration. So the number of boxes in Riemann sum, number of uh, quadrature weights in the quadrature technique or uh, samples in the Monte Carlo uh, integration. So with auto -ent, we're actually going to show how you can calculate learned definite integrals in closed form. So it actually boils down to calculating integrals with only two evaluations of the neural network rather than the hundreds of uh, evaluations of the network that you would need to evaluate an integral using, for example, Monte Carlo integration, where you need to query many, many sample points and compute their sum to integrate a function. And so to calculate integrals with AutoInt, we're going to introduce this concept of an integral network, which we call phi, which is, a co which is just a coordinate-based network that can be realized by a fully connected network or multi-layer perceptron. And we're going to observe that evaluating the derivative of the output of this network with respect to one of its inputs corresponds to just evaluating a different neural network, a different computational graph. And this is simply a, a, a different coordinate-based network with the same parameters as the integral network, but with a different architecture. So we're going to call this new network that results by taking the derivative of the integral network, uh, we call this the grad network, psi. And the key insight is that we can actually train this grad network to represent a signal of interest. And after we use the learned weights to reassemble the integral network, which by construction is an antiderivative of the signal that we fitted. And then by the fundamental theorem of calculus, this integral network is an antiderivative of the grad network, and we can calculate any definite integral uh, of a signal represented by our grad network psi by simply evaluating phi at the two bounds of integration. And so this allows us to learn closed form solutions to integral uh, to, to integrals in this fashion. So there are basically a few steps uh, on how to do this. Um, so first, you would specify the architecture of the integral network, again, usually just a fully connected neural network. And then we instantiate the grad network by taking the derivative of the output of the integral network with respect to the input variable that we want to integrate. And this gives us a new computational graph or neural network that we call the grad network. We train the grad network to fit the signal we want to integrate. And then after training, we can reassemble the integral network and evaluating this network basically uh, gives us the antiderivative. And we can use this to evaluate definite integrals of the signal that we fitted. And so in practice, we implement this with a, a little compiler that we build on top of PyTorch. Here, the computational graphs are represented as directed acyclic graphs. And we have a... Um, a custom framework that will basically take as input one of these graphs representing a network, and we can instantiate directly the computational graph corresponding to the derivative of this network with respect to one of its inputs and uh, efficiently evaluate it. So the interesting thing about derivatives of neural networks is that because of the uh, product rule and chain rule, they, they look kind of like a tree, but the branches all share uh, the same weights and share computation. So in this framework, actually evaluating uh, these gradient networks is very efficient because we can kind of share computation through these branches uh, rather than running you know, a, a forward pass through each of them. And uh, this also avoids, I, I think, a conventional pitfall in training on gradients of neural networks where you at training or inference time, run a forward pass through the neural network. Then you calculate the derivative of that network output with respect to the input. And then that's what eventually is your output or goes to your loss function. Here, we can kind of skip the first forward pass and simply just evaluate the grad, the grad network directly. So let's start by... Um, um, showing a little first example uh, where we wish to integrate this one dimensional signal. So we fit the grad network to the signal with direct supervision. So similar to the example we've uh, shown in the very first part of our talk, where we take uh, uh, X in the input domain and fit the grad network to the 
psi, psi of x to the output f of x uh, of the function. And then once the grand network is uh, fitted, we uh, reassemble its weight uh, in this integral uh, network. And now, um, based on this fundamental theorem of calculus, evaluating the definite integral phi of x, which is uh, the integral between zero and x of psi of, f, of, psi of x, uh, corresponds simply to subtracting the network output at the two bounds of integration. So for instance, if you want the output at x between x and zero here, or a and b, you would subtract the uh, output of the integral network between b and a. So let's see how autoint now can be used to evaluate integrals in two dimensions. And here we're looking at a scenario which is uh, um, taken from computed tomography, where we wish to integrate along a parallel rays through this simulated 2D phantom. And as we calculate integrals on grays at varying angles, we can create an image of projections that we also call a sinogram. And so the integral equation that computes this projection is called the radon transform. And for this example, we're gonna suppose that as measurements, we have a sparse projection, uh, a sparse, sorry, a sparse set of projection at unobserved uh, angles. So this is what we are uh, representing here. So we have only a few sets of uh, what we grade here, angles theta, and we are interested in producing the unknown set of measurements, um, which here are denoted by this kind of little question marks. And so this is a scenario which is in 2D, very similar to the novel view synthesis that we have in, uh, that we are gonna see as a next example for volume rendering. And it's also a very relevant application for uh, sparse view computed tomography, which is uh, a domain, a field of high relevance for uh, medical imaging. And so here um, we learn the integrals that will yield these unknown projections. And during training, the grad network is supervised directly on these sparse projections by approximating the integrals with Monte Carlo sampling. But after training, we reassemble the integral network and evaluates the integrals corresponding to projections at all angles. So concretely, this means we are in painting the missing projections. We, we are, we are synthet synthesizing them. And so those um, uh, left term uh, calculated by Monte Carlo approximation in the, in the uh, volume psi. And um, we can see now that the grad network contains the derivative of the activation since the grand network contains the derivative of the activation function used in the integral network, in fact, this has a huge impact on performance. And so here we are comparing um, different nonlinearities such as Swish, um, Soft Plus, Siren at um, four different um, uh, integral network and uh, grad network. And uh, we realized that actually, depending on the nonlinearity you use, because the nonlinearity appears in kind of in a funny way, if you looked in this in this uh, previous graph, in the in the grad network, um, it it doesn't perform as well depending on what you use. And in particular, we realized empirically that Swish in this case works very well um, in the in this integral grad network pair. And we're gonna talk a bit about that uh, uh, later in the conclusion as well, because we think it's an interesting avenue for uh, research. And well, while for, sub for a subsampling of four, uh, all the nonlinearities perform relatively, relatively well, as you increase the subsampling, so as you increase the number of views that you're actually missing in your, in your, um, uh, in your sinogram, uh, you realize that actually a uh, swish uh, becomes pretty good compared to other uh, nonlinearities that have very hard time to interpolate um, between views properly. So finally, what we want to talk about is really how can we leverage auto int for applications in three-dimensional rendering? So here we aim to render scenes uh, by evaluating the so-called volume rendering equation that we show here. And with this equation, we render each pixel by casting a ray through the volume and integrating the absorption, transmittance, and emissive uh, radiance and uh, to produce uh, a color uh, 
for this particular uh, ray. And so what's uh, specific about this volume rendering equation is because it derives from uh, integral differential equation, you have this two nested integral. So you have the outer integral uh, from Tn to Tf, which is um, marching along your ray, and the inner integral, which is marching along a certain point that you're currently marching on the on the ray to compute the particle to compute the opacity up to that point. And so we cannot immediately apply auto int because we've seen we can use auto int for simple integrals, but how do we deal with this kind of nested integral? So here we had to introduce a piecewise approximation to learn efficient closed form solutions um, uh, of this uh, equation. And so in the end, taking a Riemann sum uh, along, this, uh, along this section. So I think it's gonna be uh, clear in this, uh, in this uh, with maybe with a little bit of math here. So we're basically saying that our um, uh, outer integral is a sum, a Riemann sum along uh, piecewise uh, segments. And now we redefine all the quantities as average quantities over these piecewise sections. So like the emissive radiance, the transmissions, and the absorption coefficients become little averages uh, over these piecewise sections that we'll be able to compute with uh, auto int. And so uh, uh, you can see the terms defined here. So the average radiance and the average absorption now can be computed with two different networks that use the auto int trick to compute the um, uh, sigma bar and c bar integral. So we can vary the number of sections in our piecewise approximation. And we have a trade-off between the quality of the novel view synthesis and the computational requirements. So here the sections are the number of outer sums that we had in the previous equation. And here we use 8, 16, 32, and 64 piecewise sections on a synthetic scene that is rendered uh, in Blender and is kind of a standard benchmark now for neural volume rendering. And obviously you can see that you can achieve better quality with more section, but you obviously obtain faster render times with uh, fewer sections as you have only fewer points to uh, calculate the bounds of your uh, uh, integrals that we saw in the previous equation. And so AutoInt achieves high image quality on these uh, synthetic set that views while reducing the render times by up to 10 times uh, relative to uh, um, the original neural radiance fields uh, paper. And our approach also accurately render surfaces that have challenges reflectance properties, um, better than neural volumes, for instance, that is a, an approach using a conventional encoder in the voxel grid, and that we see here in the second column. So you can see, for instance, that the specularities are better in auto eight here than in these neural volumes. And this also works on real captured scenes where we, we have a few glitches that are probably uh, also done due to this, uh, to this uh, a piecewise approximation. But uh, overall, like the, the views are actually um, pretty close to the, uh, to the ground truth. Right, so we, we think AutoInt is a really interesting framework and this ability to calculate uh, integrals of neural networks uh, is really interesting and potentially very powerful, but we also wanna highlight a few open questions that, that still remain. And one has to do with these grad networks that we talked about before. And remember that with AutoInt, we're not training a normal fully connected neural network, but we're actually training its derivative. And this has this tree-like structure uh, that contains both the conventional nonlinearity, but also the derivatives of nonlinearities. And this is kind of, uh, to our knowledge, more uncharted territory in the literature. And, and how do you actually optimize these networks and make them expressive? They're certainly not as, um, as 
expressive as a normal fully connected network and haven't been as highly optimized in research. So I think looking at these gradient networks, finding better architectures that have closed form integral solutions is an interesting avenue of research. The second point I wanna highlight is that, um, yeah, there might be other, there may even be other types of neural networks that have closed form solutions. The, the way that we went about it is to kind of put this together by construction. So we, we find a network that has a closed form integral solution by simply taking its derivative, and then we know kind of how to get back to where we came from. But there may be other types of networks that have this closed form integral property, but uh, are more expressive or easier to train and so on. And um, the third point is uh, a little more subtle, but um, what we've done in AutoInt is trained the grad network but we could also look at the other way and around and train the integral networks. And maybe this is useful for some applications. And in fact, you can do this. Uh, you, can, you can train the integral network and recover the grad network as well. Uh, so do things the other way around, but you just need to supervise on uh, all the bounds of the, inter of the integral so that you learn kind of all possible definite integrals. And so to, to summarize, we've talked about an emerging class of, of networks that we're seeing, uh, I think kind of exploding in the literature, uh, coordinate-based networks. And really we think of this as a new way to represent signals. So we talked about sirens, which are a specific, a specific class of coordinate-based networks that offer a lot more representational power and can fit signals as well as their derivatives. Uh, we also, talked about ACORN, which is a new type of architecture that we, uh, we call an implicit explicit architecture. It combines coordinate-based networks with, with, with feature grids to scale up to representing large scale signals. And a key question is how we can uh, apply mathematical operations to these representations and manipulate them similar to how we would manipulate conventional discretely sampled signals. And we explored this began exploring this with the AutoEd framework, which allows us to integrate neural representations. And we think that this new way of represent signals is really transforming uh, or has the potential to transform the way that we represent and process all types of different signals across many different domains, whether it's audio, images, videos, uh, for solving physics-based problems or, or just signals in general. And we think that this is a, a really exciting and promising direction. Uh, and so with that, I'd like to thank uh, uh, our collaborators. Um, thanks again for the invitation to come, come and speak. And I'd also like to mention that um, if you're interested in learning more about these projects or, or other projects that we've worked on, that people in our lab have worked on, uh, go ahead and check out our website, computationalimaging.org, and you'll find uh, papers, supplemental material, additional videos, as well as, as code. Uh, and the code for all these papers, that, all these projects that we've talked about is also available as well. So uh, again, thanks very much for, for listening and, and again for the invitation. Thanks a lot for listening and for the invitation. Thank you very much for the presentation. This was really great. I loved your presentation and I have some applause for you. I hope you can hear it. <laughs> thanks very much. Unfortunately, only out of the box, but I'm sure that our audience would be applauding wildly now. <laughs> well, this was really a cool presentation. I enjoyed it. And there's a lot of new things in there for me. And it was really nicely presented. So that's really a cool way of representing signals. So if you think about Siren, can, can I imagine that it's essentially a kind of a filter bank that you are learning during the process? And it's just problem optimal? And, com and you could compare it maybe to a Fourier or wavelet representation. Is that something how one could summarize, like a custom-made filter bank for a specific problem? Yeah, I think uh, it's kind of a, yeah, this is a good question. So it's not exactly a, a filter bank or linear basis function because we've basically embedded signs within signs within signs in this architecture. Um, but I do kind of think of it as some sort of nonlinear basis function that you're learning in somehow a signal uh, dependent way. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think an interesting direction to 
that's worth pursuing further is this generalization problem of how do you make this you know, so-called filter bank or this nonlinear basis function that you're learning uh, not sp specific or overfitted to one signal, but uh, can you generalize it to a whole space of signals and, and what um, might that be? I think that is incredibly useful for, for learning priors over signals and um, for a bunch of things like generative models as well. Mm -hmm. And did you then also think about like like properties of what kind of frequencies can be represented by which number of coefficients and uh, like you would do Nyquist Shannon on such linear yeah. further things, right? So did you think about a relation to that? So yeah, I I think it's uh, I um, no I think we really like this question because that's actually something we are looking at uh, right now. And so one thing that these representations really allow you to, to do is that because you somehow choose the basis function, it's possible that in addition of getting this uh, derivability, integrability, and things like this, you can, for instance, choose the type of constraints you're going to induce on the class of signals you're going to be able to represent. So say, for instance, you want band-limited signals, say you want positive signals, say you want uh, signals with a particular decay in their frequency spectrum. And so I think we have super hyper cool work in the pipeline, and that mm -hmm. should be out very soon. And that explore uh, actually exactly those type of, uh, of questions. And uh, not really explore, but I hope provide some answers into how you can actually uh, do that. And so just to maybe complete the answer a bit more, it's because it's not easy if you think about it and you have a grid. Uh, say you want to induce a particular decay or you want to uh, uh, make your signal positive. Well, the only way you can really do that is by having a regularizer in your optimization function, but there's no way to do it in a built-in or custom fashion. But this, I think, is really what this representation allows you to do. And that's why I think we're so excited about them. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I would just add that different architectures have different, uh, as we saw, they have different inductive biases, but also often these different architectures will have some tuning parameters that can somehow control the, the bandwidth or the frequencies mm -hmm. of the signal. So Fourier features has a scale parameter that controls kind of the, the bandwidth of the positional encoding. Siren has this frequency tuning parameter we called omega naught that uh, shows up in each layer that kind of scales the frequencies. And you can kind of make the representation smoother or lower frequency or much higher frequency with these tuning parameters. But exactly what the what bandwidth they correspond to in the representation is not really. Uh, I haven't seen anything that describes that, or I, I don't think that's well understood. And did you look at the compression levels that you can achieve with Siren and Acorn? Um... I assume that you are pretty good in terms of, uh, you know, getting rid of parts of the data that is not really used for representation. So, I guess this is uh, I guess this is correct. Uh, I think if you use a plain um, implicit representation for compression, you're already going to get some compression level. I think there's still a tons of research that can be done because, for instance, we're not looking at quantizing the weights. And if you're looking at things like JPEG, you have run length encoding. So we're not doing any fancy thing like this. Also, JPEG is not compressing the whole signal, but it's locally compressing the signal. So here, maybe, you know, like, again, using something like ACORN might, might make more sense. So I think going into compression is kind of a really a story in itself. I, I know there are many people interested in this. I think we've looked at that a little bit less, David and I. I know there are efforts also in our lab to do that and the efforts in, in other places to do that. So I think it's definitely an interesting uh, interesting question. But uh, there's really a lot of, I would say, uh, um, I, want to, I want to say domain-specific knowledge as soon as you touch compression because there's so much traditional research that has been done that, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think for, I would just add, I think for images, you can, the representations can be compressive um, uh, and you could probably get something similar to like JPEG, but where they become really powerful, I think is for high, high dimensional signals. Like if you look at NERF and it's parameterizing this 5D function, three spatial dimensions and then view dependencies, um, I mean, that to represent explicitly is, is, is very, 
uh, takes a lot of memory and the representation is incredibly compressive. And we see the same thing. I think you see also gains for 3D models um, and compared to mesh-based representations or point clouds, these things can be uh, certainly superior to that. And then layering on top of that different compression techniques like quantization or pruning or entropy coding, uh, I think can get you much further, but we have not uh, as of yet, explored these techniques. Though I think compression people are starting to look into this more and more. Hmm. Regarding the uh, acorn, um, so when you when you do rendering, you are often interested in ray surface intersections. Is this? The, I, I guess acorn is much better than siren because you probably have to sample a lot if you want to do that in siren, but. Um, did, did you think about that, um, how to do that efficiently? So, yeah, there are, so there are, there are two, uh, I say, so the first, the first thing I would, I would, I would say is that because in all these, in all these 3D applications, we're either um, fitting occupancies or uh, in uh, volume rendering using this volume rendering equation. So we don't really per se have to calculate ray surface intersection because these are like volume rendering techniques. That's the, the first thing. But this being said, there's a lot of commonality still because we need to make rays traverse boxes. And in some sense, uh, you need to compute intersections and whether we are with surfaces or whether with, there are boxes, you need to have clever ways to, to do traversal uh, algorithms. And um, we've we've done things like this. I think uh, I would say one of the reference work for this would be this uh, neurometric uh, neural geometric level of details that actually really explicits the the traversing algorithms to do that with this neural representation. So um, I would say like this is really the, the work to look at. But indeed, it's perfectly compatible with this type of uh, uh, representation that are a hybrid implicit explicit mm -hmm. or, yeah. or or that have a local component uh, exactly. and you know in an oct tree yeah. 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 yeah 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 as soon yeah. as you have the oct tree it gets much easier right yeah yeah so this neural geometric level of detail paper showed real-time rendering of 3d shapes uh from the neural representation and that's basically enabled by this really fast uh sparse voxel oct tree intersection code that they have uh yeah. so we don't, we don't have that explicitly in acorn but i, I believe it's compatible and you could you could look at combining these types of approaches. It it looks very much like that you can use that, and it's yeah. it's a very elegant technique that you essentially solve the sampling problem of the oak tree. Um, so it's it's really cool. So uh, regarding auto int, um, you know sometimes you when you do physical measurements you can only measure the differential phase, and then you also would like to reconstruct like the the integral. But then you get these phase wraps because you can only measure essentially over a range of two pi and then the signal repeats. But I figure if you choose the right architecture for that, you could also model phase wraps in, in auto int and then get much better integrations, right? Yeah, I think it's I think it's really interesting. We've not looked at that directly, but I, I think where, where you're going, and I, I think it's exactly the promise of this representation is that you could have something that um, uh, obliges your signal to be smooth. And in all these phase and wrapping algorithms, there's always some regularization that tries to um, make sure that uh, at a, locally you can be uh, 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 not super smooth, but globally you need to be smooth and have this kind of smoothness properties so that you can basically, uh, so that you're representing like a valid, say, uh, mm -hmm. phase of, uh, I don't know, like an incoming uh, wave front or whatever. And so, I think this is something we, you could probably do, right? The, the same way you would, because I'm always thinking every time you can use in a conventional optimization problem, like your regularizer, you know, on smoothness, then you can always, or you should always be able to use the right implicit representation, which embeds this regularization term. Uh, but yeah, so David is much more of an expert in this than, than I am, I would say. So. Oh, I was going to say Julian's the expert, but oh. uh, yeah, you know, I think we've seen some of these uh, in computational imaging, these modulo cameras that, uh, wrap, wrap um, the image. Image gets mod moduloed and wrapped, and you have to solve a phase unwrapping problem. So this is some one thing that's familiar to me. And I think the comment that Julian's making is that uh, you could choose rather than representing the signal that you're optimizing on a grid to represent it with the neural network. And now, what advantage does that get you? You have whatever inductive bias the neural network has, and uh, you have 
the ability to just supervise the neural network to get the solution. And the relevant literature to that is probably more on, um, it's more of what we were getting into with Siren, but if these physics inform neural networks where you have some like forward model or physics-based equation that you're using to supervise the neural network that represents a solution to whatever you're interested in. Yeah, but technically you could also force the representation to be regularized. So whenever you yep. decode that the, the output is implicitly run through the regularization. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, I think, kind of an untapped potential of these representations. Um, most of these physics-informed neural networks are just relying on whatever the inductive bias is of the yeah. network, but it should, in fact, learn some sort of prior that would be way more powerful. It's really exciting what, what kind of connections we are just suddenly drawing and uh, where you can also use this. So it's really, really cool work. I'm, I'm very much enjoying what, what I've seen. And um, one thing I was wondering is uh, in, in medical, you had also saw this example with CT reconstruction, then you synthesize directly the views, but did you look also at the volumes? So at the, the 3D or the 2D representation after mm. solving the inverse random transform? So not in this particular computed tomography example, because uh, here, in fact, we, this example is a bit subtle because really, in fact, like the equivalent of a sinogram is really a view in this nerve framework, right? I mean, so the, we are not really solving an inverse problem. And I think I, I really like this example because I find it, I, I find it, uh, um, the pedagogic, but at the same time, it's a bit confusing. However, we are looking at exactly this problem in another project that we have, where we are looking at the cryon electron microscopy um, mm -hmm. uh, imaging, which is also a tomographic problem, where uh, we are looking exclusively at the volume, because what we are interested in is that you get these views of molecules from unknown orientations and from views of the molecules taken with uh, electron beams. Uh, you try to reconstruct the atomic structure of the molecule via their electrostatic potential, so via the density, the physical density, electrostatic density that they produce. And those, only the volume matters. We don't even care about the view. And so this, we can say, works extremely well. So one caveat, though, is that the type of electrostatic density we are looking at are relatively smooth because they are physical objects, you know, that have to do with, uh, uh, so these this potentials, they follow these uh, uh, um, Boltzmann equations um, and the Poisson-Boltzmann equations and have this very, very smooth decay. Uh, so in fact, we are kind of in an ideal scenario where you can reconstruct these volumes probably very well. And I would not guarantee anything about volumes that have, you know, very sharp, uh, you know, edges or things like this. Um, which I know is also a problem in general for, you know, for tomographic applications. Um, so yeah, short answer is it does work uh, and we've not published that yet, but I think it's going to be out very soon too. Um, yeah. And it's, it's somehow also what NERF does when they look at the density, when they produce the depth map, right? Like the depth map is a proxy mm -hmm. to the density and, and it works to some extent. It works well. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> David, Julian. This was really an exciting talk. I learned much. I think what you do has so much potential. I really loved your presentation and how you have been showing and summarizing these really nice concepts. And I would love to, to work with these concepts also in the future. So I think this has many, many applications and can be combined with many other methods. And I really thank you for being here. And I do have another round of applause for you. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much. It was a pleasure being here and uh, thanks again for the invitation. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So you see, there was an exciting presentation today. We had plenty of questions. Our audience was really engaged. I hope you enjoyed this presentation as much as I did. I learned a ton of new things about neural representations and how this can be involved in rendering. And I'm very, very glad that they actually accepted the invitation to come here to our presentation series. So if you like the video, leave a like, subscribe to this channel, and I'm very much looking forward to seeing you in one of the next videos in Beyond the Patterns. Bye bye.